Hi there. Hi. Um, so, uh, talk a bit about biometrics today. And so, there's a definition of that, and it's this uh, idea that we can derive knowledge from the analysis of human physiological data. And one of the reasons why we might want to do that has to do with this idea of um, you know, this express purpose of improving our creative design abilities. So the potential here of, uh, of biometrics you know, is related to this like relationship people have with computational frameworks. There are kind of three aspects really here. And one of them is this idea of like an improved computer human interface. So like the way that we normally work with computers, you know, that has the potential to be sort of radically transformed, I think. And um, in particular, using this vehicle of direct emotional and motivational state feedback. And then finally, in, in terms of, you know, our design efforts on computational systems, this kind of idea of extending the cross-cultural uh, communication and reach of, um, of our design. So when it comes to, um, like, you know, as a designer, like, you're, uh, and many people here, I'm sure, use computers in your work, whether you're a writer or a composer or some kind of architect or uh, there's, we're surrounded by computational frameworks that allow us to do our work. And, and so uh, all, all the results of this work that we do, it's, it's, it's stimulus really to us. And so, uh, so you, you, you perform some effort and then there's a response that you have as a designer to this work. And all stimulus, uh, life is a process of stimulus and response. And so design stimulus is just another kind and we do have a specific physiological response to that. And so, and when we, do, it's kind of when, when Gino Yu was talking the other day about like our shadow state, this is sort of what he's referring to is that you have stimulus and then sort of like a subterranean response. And then this shadow state really is, is uh, what's caused by, by this, the, environmental stimulus of which the design efforts that we're involved in is a part of and, and phy our physiological responses are linked to this, this idea of motivational state and emotional, and emotional dimension. So here's, here, here are some examples, simple examples of what I'm talking about. And so there, this idea of like, okay, let's say something is either pleasant or unpleasant. So uh, zygomatis act zygomaticus activity, this, these muscles here. So when I smile, it kind of pulls my lips up and it makes it like a smile and then, or I could frown like this and this would be called corrugator. And so, uh, so there should be sound here, I think on this. And so this is a, um, uh, uh, an example of, um, <laughs> if it was playing. So this is uh, Vivaldi. And uh, so there's a, a kind of idea that you have a specific stimulus and then, um, uh, so it results in kind of facial contractions that would result in a smile. And um, no possibility for sound, so it's not happening. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. oh, there's another one. Okay, so, or you could have unpleasant stimulus. Like, uh, and so this would be um, uh, just the exact counterexample of where you would have more corrugator function Jessica, as a result of hearing something unpleasant. Uh, and so, uh, so the kind of um, from a historical and contemporary, from considering both historical and contemporary views, th this whole idea of like 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 physiological state and uh, and it, its its relationship to kind of stimulus, it, you could, many people think it's kind of started with David Hume and he uh, he wrote in 1740 this treatise on human nature, and. One thing he wrote in particular is this like very famous statement. It says that like, reason is uh, not only to be the slave of passions. And so what he was talking about here is this idea that we have um, the shadow state, right? And uh, that, that it consists of, um, a, you know, kind of like uh, there's this uh, sort of emotional sea and then our rational thought sort of sits on top of this. And depending on how we feel emotionally or motivationally, that kind of directs rational thought to like, we, maybe we look here or maybe we look here. And, we make up kind of stories about this, uh, the, the stuff that we observe, but it, it's, it's, it's sort of sitting on this emotional sea of, of data. And when it comes to emotions in particular, it's still a little unclear exactly what they are. There's at least three definitions of what an emotion is currently. But uh, James, I like his um, 
from 1884, he felt that emotion is a feeling that results from a specific physiological state. So you, you have a stimulus that happens. There's uh, a, a physiological change in one's body. And then the emotion, uh, an emotion is sort of like our, our kind of like naming of that feeling is, is what James thought an emotion was. Uh, moving forward a little bit, a few years to Levinson in 1992, he looked at um, physiological state and was really interested in it because he felt like it was something, this kind of shadow state again. This, he, he felt it was a, uh, a kind of, what um, had the potential to be a little bit, um, uh, you know, kind of like with something that sort of would sit below culture and below language and upbringing and all that stuff. And he did some work with the Minangkabau of West Sumatra and U.S. college students, two very diverse groups of people, and then uh, exposed them to kind of certain sorts of, um, kind of so social experiments and found that there was very consistent uh, expression of physiology as related to emotional state between these like very diverse groups of people. So I'm speaking in terms of design. Let's say if I'm, 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 a, I'm a designer and I'm working on a certain thing and I have a specific emotional or motivational state response to like something then, and if somebody else maybe in a whole different part of the world has a kind of similar emotional and a motivational state response, then you can kind of count on that as perhaps being like really real and, and, and very connected to, to what you're feeling. And then finally, Blaskovich, he, he talked about something, he wrote about this kind of idea that, that maybe is a little bit of an adjunct to emotion, which is this idea of a motivational state. And he felt that uh, in, in addition to this kind of standard um, you know, emotional framework, there's, there's a kind of core relational theme that, that people have when they go through their lives. And when we encounter things that are momentous, that we either approach them either as a challenge or a threat, and then these are indexed by very clear physiological variables. So when it comes to biometrics, there's uh, different types of physiological data. There's biometrics that point to emotional dimension and biometrics that point to this motivational state, this work by Blask Blaskovich. So this picture here is called the circumplex model of affect, and um, this this is uh, uh, this work was done in the in the eighties, and this this kind of idea of uh, that you have um, a kind of plotting of, of human expression, human emotional expression on this uh, X Y chart here, with pleasure and displeasure. So zygomaticus, pleasure, and then displeasure corrugator could be an example along the horizontal axis. And along the vertical axis, you have activation and deactivation. So there it would be, um, um, you know, like for instance, decreased heart rate, uh, decreased electrodermal activity, and then, or maybe increased heart rate and increased electrodermal activity to express activated or deactivated state. And then you can see, kind of plot whether or not someone would be sad or joyous or angry or calm on the basis of these um, perceived variables. These are just an example of, of many that could be used to kind of plot uh, human emotion. And then with respect to motivational state, there's this, um, this little bit different variables that are used here. And so in terms of looking at either challenge or threat, uh, for instance, a, a challenge would be that you feel that you have sufficient resources to meet the demands that are placed upon you. And a threat would be when you, you feel like you lack those resources. And so, and then these, uh, these, these, these these basic sort of core relational themes have a very specific effect on one's physiology. And so, for instance, when it comes to challenge, and it's like an aerobic response, a challenge response to things. So you have almost no change in blood pressure. It could go either way. Uh, you have a, a, a kind of a large increase in stroke volume. This is the amount of blood that your heart pumps with each beat. And then you have a drop in vascular resistance. So you kind of move blood easier through your body. Under, the, under that condition, under a challenge condition. And a threat condition, you, you have a, a, a spike in blood pressure, you have a, a, a small or no change in, in stroke volume, and then you have a, a small or no change in, um, in vascular resistance. And, and it's pretty clear that, that one is more inclined to relate to a situation or, or engage it if, if you're challenged rather than threatened. W what's interesting about, about challenge and threat though is it's really subject to training. And so when, when you're, um, exposed to certain things, you, you can easily take a threat situation and turn it into a challenge situation uh, simply by training and, and learning about it. So here, here's an example of a, of a possible design um, interface for uh, emotional computer interface. 
So this idea that the computer presents this design result to, to us and, and then there's a physiological change that occurs when we perceive this, this design. And then the, the, the computational framework determines if there's an emotional dimension and or a motivational state associated with that, uh, that change. And then there's maybe a decision about taking action or not. And then if the computer or whatever is gonna take action, then it would maybe stimulate the environment in some way that might stimulate either the design itself or change in the design itself or stimulate the environment that the person's in. But there's some action that's taking place because the computational framework is aware of one's emotional dimension and our motivational state. So here's, here's a typical, uh, the typical way that design is done, right? Like so, let's say you're an architect, right? And so uh, you, you, you sit there in front of your computer and so that's that yellow box at the bottom and the, the design, you're working on the design and it's expressing and maybe the architect is not using the speakers but they're using the monitor and so there's some physiological presentation or stimulus that's coming through the monitor, right? And then the architect is having some motivational, emotional response, right, to the design. So they're seeing the design, they say, oh, I either like it or I don't. Like, maybe they're in the, the, um, the atrium of the building and it's like not pleasing to them, but there's, there's some, that, you know, they're working it through, right? And so they have some emotional, motivational response. And then there's David Hume who's saying that, well, our rational guidance is based on the sort of emotional framework and then there's an idea that one forms and then there's the physiological control that the architect expresses either through the mouse or the keyboard right now, which affects the design, which results in new stimulus. And so it's this kind of loop that goes counterclockwise here. You could call that the designer loop, like the way one interacts with computational systems from a design point of view. And so uh, just backing up here a little bit, Let's pretend that instead of going around this whole loop, like, like at the point where it goes motivational, emotional, cog, uh, you know, cognitive um, um, response, um, what, 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 before you got to the point of rational guidance, if you got, before you got to that point, you kind of just looped back into the computer. So what if the computer could, could become aware of your, your situation without having you to come to some sort of rational thought about what you want to do, and so you don't really actually form this kind of idea, right? You don't even form that, right? And so you, you have instead a, a, a very tight relationship that's just from the, the response back to the computer and then back again. It just sort of resonates in there and it, it's subject to just emotional framework and not to rational guidance. And so here's an example of a system that does that. So this is a, this is a, a brain computer interface and what the way this works is, is that the computer presents stimulus to the, uh, to the person and the person's EEGs are being measured and then there's a kind of very specific response called the P300, which then um, stimulates the person's peripheral nervous system in a way and stimulates the brain so that there's this sort of like kind of resonance actually that gets established between the computational system and the person in order to actually affect communication. And so it's a, it's a, this is a good kind of early example of this kind of idea and um, of the, of this sort of like a uh, kind of system working that works below rational thought. This system works that way. So, um, Here's the more complicated picture. So the more complicated picture is that you have a designer and so they're doing this work and they have some, they're going through and they're working on their computational system, they're designing, they're coming up with rational thought. And, and so this top person could be this architect again, this designer loop. And then this bottom loop, it'd be like the recipient or the client, right, of the architect. And the client also has a response to the work. And so, and so, and, and, and so the, there, the, the, all these rational ideas are getting formed and these emotional, motivational responses and the, the client has them and the designer has them. And they, they, they really only communicate through this one really kind of like very tenuous bridge, which is this, this kind of like email maybe that gets sent from the client to the architect or a phone call or a, a, a kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, maybe a face-to-face -face meeting over coffee or something, but which might be the most successful probably out of all of them. But but really, it, it's cumbersome. Th and so this idea of like, how does the client properly communicate to the designer? And how do you kind of get emotional data, right? Like all this, um, the, the emotion the architect has about their work and the emotion the client has about their work and how do you fuse them? It's so that they become kind of linked. And, um, 
So it, it, you, these, these kind of green arrows and boxes show that you, you could have, like if the, if the computational frameworks were capable of, 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 of presenting emo emotional data and then also capable of responding to emotional data, then you could, you could put the client and the architect in kind of an emotional, motivational state resonance loop. They would, they would kind of bounce off each other and the computational framework or the computer system could be kind of the, 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 the glue that sort of binds them together. And that could be a VR representation or whatever, but, but both could experience the design and, and manipulate it in real time. And uh, so, so um, here are some examples of, of, of computational systems that do reflect emotional state. This is work by uh, Mikey Siegel, one of our very own Mikey Siegel, where help worked on this. This is an MDS robot in 2008. It's a robot that's capable of, 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 making, of, of making very intelligible understandable emotional expressions like happiness and sadness and boredom. And, and then just to the right here, there's uh, some work out of Singapore, the, um, the Mixed Reality Lab, and they worked on this thing called the Babbage Cabbage, which is this idea of empathic living media. So it's, it, the, the data is not coming through a computer screen at all, but it's actually coming through the form of a plant, in this case a cabbage, that is changing color on the, and it's like sits in your garden, right? This cabbage sits in your garden. And, uh, and then depending on like the state of world affairs, like you know population or, or pollution or whatever, or the, 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 the state of your daughter's health, that all gets reflected in the color state of the cabbage and, and you have this sort of like more emotional connection, right? To the, 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 the circumstances because the media is living. Is that, the, the, these, are, these are kind of ideas that explore this idea of like, how does one m make a stronger emotional connection to somebody other than through like a mouse other than through like a speakers and a keyboard, right? I'm sorry, a, a speakers and a, and a video monitor. So, so here, here's an example of a, of a, of a more comprehensive picture. And that th this is er early work in 2008 that, uh, that Biopac was involved in, which w involved, it was like the, the election before this one, and uh, actually, and uh, so too before actually, and there's uh, Barack Obama and Hillary and uh, Edwards, I believe. And, and so this is the Democratic uh, primaries. And so th there was interest in, in exploring this like relationship, right? Like you have, like in this case, instead of the architect, right, as the designer, you have the politician who's a designer. And then the recipient is the voter, right? And so this was an attempt to kind of explore this idea of an emotional, motivational interface connection between like the designer and the recipient. And here, there was like independent voters that were we were looking at corrugator and looking at electrodermal activity, and then there were messages, right? Like, so you have the political message being presented, and then the recipients were hearing the message as stimulus. They have a specific physiological or motivational response. That data is being measured and then reflected back to the politician in some sort of framework, right? And so that would be an example of kind of like designer to recipient sort of fusing. So where are we now? We're in, in circa 2016. R right now, basically, our, our primary computer interfaces are uh, our pointing interfaces. This is like 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 what like a, like tablets or a, you know like a, a stylus or a, or a mouse, and we also have keyboards. And then we have uh, you have complex uh, analog data like video and audio, which is kind of primary stimulus. And then we. This, this, this human physiological base signal stuff is, is actually a little bit less complicated than the audio and video, like it's, it's the data rates aren't as high. And uh, so it ju it's, also, it's just complex analog data, much like that. So it's, it's, it's not, not for lack of te processing ability, it's more just like maybe lack of focus. That's why we don't have as much of that. So what's, um, what's possible now, like at, at this point in time, we, there's equipment available that allow us to determine emotional dimension, um, and then equipment, uh, uh, techniques that would allow us to determine motivational state, and we can introduce plenty good at introducing stimuli, in terms of, you know, visually or auditorily, and then we, we we would also be in this position through application software design of pairing emotional dimension and motivational state to specific stimulus. So the kinds of signals that we can look at now are. Uh, for emotional dimension be like electrocardiogram, electrodermal, skin temperature, respiration, pulse plethysmography. A motivational state would be like blood pressure, ECG, and uh, stroke volume or like cardiac output. 
And the kinds of stimulus that could come from the computer could be things like uh, the computer maybe is establishing some kind of emotional rapport with you. And it, it would be maybe something like the computer might change the scent in the room or it could change the music or the chair temperature or uh, it could maybe pop up a, a, hyper, a hyperlink that it feels is relevant for you in terms of your work. He, he back to the architect, here, here's an example of how something could work. Like, like let's say you have the client, right? And the client is like in a virtuality. And so the client's wandering through the virtuality that the architect has crafted. And so at this point in time, here's the example. The client is encountering this range of yellow doors. And so that, and the client has a specific response. There's a motivational status sort of plotted on the top there in green. And then the uh, emotional, um, the, uh, the valence, like the pleasure, displeasure is also being measured. And then arousal also is being measured. And so uh, uh, w when, 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 the, when the individual, let's say, encounters this string of yellow doors, there, the, there's an immediate drop in valence, right? So the, the client says, oh, this is like not so cool. Like it's feeling sort of like, like not good actually about this row of doors. And so there's a drop in, in valence. There's an increase in displeasure. And also the, the, the client's unmotivated, right? Like there's a motivational problem too. Like there's a, a dip in both motivational state and valence at the point of encountering these yellow doors. Arousal appears to be unaffected, but, but the, both the architect and client would be well served by, by realizing there's a direct pairing, right? An immediate direct pairing between this state in the virtuality and these kinds of signals. And so, and, and if the computational framework was aware of that, it would say, oh, well maybe what we can do from a computational point of view is like maybe we shorten the, uh, the hallway or maybe we change the door color or, and the, the computer could run through some iterations that would result in maybe a little bit less of an unpleasant experience. So anyway, how to get physiological data. So you have uh, probes that go inside the body, invasive probes, you have non-invasive probes, which are, they attach to the outside of the body and then also what we call non-contact um, sensors which don't touch the body at all. So it, uh, Non-invasive signals include things like all these standard ones, ECG and EEG and electrogastrogram and electrooculography and biomechanical ones include things like non-invasive blood pressure and bioimpedance and laser Doppler flow and, and goniometry and muscle force. And then there's a whole series of biochemical sensors too, things like blood oxygen level and, and volume of carbon dioxide expired and, and uh, functional neuroinfrared imaging and that kind of thing. And uh, so these are our standard procedures, right? How one would go about measuring this data with electrodes and uh, or sensors. It can have a variety of, of options here. And then there's um, possibilities for, um, uh, you know, for like, uh, like this is all current stuff, uh, wearable technology. So uh, devices that connect up to the body in some way that collect all the same data but are, are, are wireless effectively and all transmit l low power RF. And uh, here's some emerging non-invasive technology, FNIR. This is like uh, often referred to as a poor person's, a poor man's MRI. It, it looks at uh, cerebral blood flow, but does it through optical methods in the top half inch of the executive function of, um, or where executive function of the brain occurs. And then this is some super interesting work out of MIT. Uh, so this is, uh, this is all non-contact physiological monitoring work where you have uh, what's called Eulerian video magnification and so the, the top picture would be like a video of a person. And then the bottom picture, it, by employing this, this algorithm to the video, you can actually see changes in blood flow through the individual's face by magnifying uh, slight uh, changes in the pixels. And uh, so readily observe like heart rate and th things like that just from video imagery. And then there's uh, this, this thing called vital radio, which is just a, a couple, couple years ago can be set up inside of a house that uses uh, microwave Doppler radar to establish kind of standing fields in the room and you can look at respiration and also uh, um, electrocardiograph data that way. And so these are the kinds of other kinds of non-contact monitor signal types. Uh, you have motion tracking, image and video. Uh, this is kind of, uh, Nicole touched on this idea of like a facial recognition and that would be sort of like a video processing of, 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 um, of of, of what someone's face looks like and then mapping that to emotional states. Um, Doppler radar scent, heel toe strike, all these things are, are, are kinds of physiological data that you can collect off someone without, without touching them at all. Like it's just completely uh, hands off. 
This is new uh, technology that's um, it's being explored, this idea of like electronic tattoos and then also ingestible biosensors. And then finally, um, just to kind of wrap up, it just shows you the, the potential of using um, uh, biometric data in terms of creative expression. This is a film by Philippe Balouk called Aura, and these are dancers, and they're totally being filmed in just infra in thermal cameras, and so that's why they're leaving marks on the floor, because they're heating up the floor as they're, they're moving across it, and so the kind of bright spots in their bodies are where they have the, are the hottest, and then the darker spots are where they're a little bit colder. And then there's one more here too, I think. It's a company Linga out of Switzerland, and they, um, th th this is, this is uh, some biopack equipment, and they're, it's looking at core physiologic data, and then this data is being sonified, right? And the, the dancer essentially is like dancing to their own physiology. And that um, is it. Thank you very much.